Thank you so much, Kenneth. Good to see you guys this morning. And um, is everybody doing all right? All right, some of you. That's good. We'll take it. We'll take it this morning. Amen. All right, man, I'm excited about today. And um, how many of y'all are familiar with the name Zacchaeus? All right. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the name Zacchaeus? Who's singing it? All right, let's get our choir together and let's sing the Zacchaeus song. And, um, it, and it was funny because as, as I was studying this, this, this scripture this week and this passage this week, and I even told Ronica, I said, I was singing it the entire time as I'm sitting there studying and I couldn't get anything done. And, cause I'm, and again, every time I see Zacchaeus and on, the, on the pages of the Bible, Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. And so I even titled my sermon, A, a Wee Little Man and a Big, Big God. Amen? And, um, and again, when you study the life of Zacchaeus, and by the way, Zacchaeus was not a well-liked person. As a matter of fact, he was very disliked and very disrespected because of his profession. He was a tax collector. They're well-liked today, though, right? They weren't well-liked back then, but they are well-liked today. And, and as a matter of fact, to the Jews, again, they looked at tax collectors as traitors and those who were teaming with the enemy, which was Rome. And so Zacchaeus... His, his, actually, his name actually means righteous one. And so again, when you think of Zacchaeus and you think of the, the, the title or his name means righteous one, he was anything but righteous. Now again, here's what we know about Zacchaeus. Not only was he small in stature, and again, that's what we're always remind, we're reminded of when it comes to Zacchaeus, but Zacchaeus was a wealthy person. He, I mean, again, as, as far as wealth is concerned, and possessions, and, 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 and his social status, and he had it all. I mean, again, he was one of those people that, as you study his life, and, and you look at people today, they just have it all. But there was something missing in Zacchaeus' life. There, there was a void. There, there was an emptiness. And, and, and again, I, I, the message I want to preach today is that, again, as you think about life and People that think they have it all, but there's something still missing in their life. And Zacchaeus is, has an encounter with a man named Jesus. And after his encounter with Jesus, Zacchaeus was never the same. And isn't it good today to know that when you have an encounter with Jesus and you give your life to Jesus, that your life is never the same? And again, this is the beauty of our relationship with God is because, again, we're reminded of how our life used to be because, again, you're reminded of, man, I'm so thankful I'm not that old person. But because of what Christ did for me and when I had that encounter with Jesus, I'm a new person. So if you have your Bibles, turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 19. And again, Zacchaeus, all the pleasures, he had all the comforts of life, and again, anything that money could buy, and again, he would, he, 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 but, and by the way, guys, he was one of those people that would find it difficult to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because remember what did Jesus say also in the Gospels? He said, it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now again, was Jesus teaching that rich people can't be saved? No, that is not what he is teaching. But what do rich people tend to put their faith and trust in? Their money, their, their possessions, their wealth. Zacchaeus was no different, but there was a point in Zacchaeus' life that he acknowledged and realized there's something missing. Not even for rich people, guys, even for us, but before, before we got saved, you realize that, yeah, yeah, my life may have been going well, and, and I may have had a decent job and, and, and a great family and, and, you know, friends and this, that, and the other, but there's still something missing. And when you come to Luke chapter 19, Look at verse number one. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And by the way, Jesus is on his way to be crucified. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was, what's that word, guys? Rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press because he was little of stature. And he ran before, he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, 
for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from the man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to the, through this house, for as much as he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. Father, we come to you this morning to thank you for the word of God. Father, thank you so much for the story of Zacchaeus. And what a great reminder, Lord. Father, I want to pray today that there may be somebody sitting here, there may be somebody watching us through our live stream. Father, there's an emptiness, there's a void, there's something missing in our life. And Father, my prayer, my desire today is this. Father, they, they would fill that emptiness, they would fill that void in their life today with a relationship with our great Savior, Jesus Christ. So Father, we love you so much. Have your will and way in every heart and life today. And we'll thank you and praise you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Four things I want to share with you this morning. And, and, and again, as it pertains to Christ and as it pertains to the encounter that he had with, with Zacchaeus. But also, guys, a, a, a message I want to share with you this morning that, again, you may feel like there's something missing and that there's emptiness in your life today that I want to encourage you with as you think about who Jesus is and what, and, and what Jesus is and what he can do in your life. And again, as you look at the story with him and Zacchaeus, there's four things I want to share with you. Number one, again, as you think about Jesus, he sees you. He sees you. And, and again, I, I love the fact that, again, as you, as, you, as you look at this, and again, verse number two, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief among the publicans. He was rich. And then verse number three, he says, and he sought to do what? to see Jesus he had this desire now now again he had never met Jesus but he had I'm sure he had heard about Jesus there was a lot of people that heard about Jesus amen and so again Zacchaeus sees Jesus coming again like I said Jesus is on his way to be crucified and so again we see this in verse number four for the press because he was little of stature and he could not for the press because he was of little stature and he ran before and climbed up in the sycamore tree to see him for he was to pass that way. And guys, I love verse number five. There's so much, and again, just in, just in this one verse. And, and G, when Jesus came to the place, what did he do? He looked up and did what? He saw him. Now, let, let me go back to where, where, again, Zacchaeus was coming because he wanted to see Jesus. But the Bible says that he could not. Why? He was too short, but there was something else. The crowd. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Satan will do anything and everything in his power to keep you from getting to Jesus, including using people. But aren't you thankful that, again, that he persevered, and again, he had such a desire to see Jesus that he was going to do anything and everything that it took. And by the way, I love the fact that the Bible says that Zacchaeus ran. He ran in front of the crowd. He ran past the crowd, and he climbed up into a tree. Guys, how desperate did Zacchaeus have to be to see Jesus that he climbed up a sycamore tree? Guys, again, until there's absolute desperation in your life to fill the emptiness, you will never seek after God. But I love the fact that when Jesus, and, and again, I picture this, I picture him showing up at that tree. What caught his eye? What caught the eye of Jesus to look up and say, hey, what, what are you doing up there? You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping there was another conversation that it wasn't just a, you know, make haste and come down. You're picturing this that Jesus shows up and he's talking to Zacchaeus a little bit. And, and, and again, how many of you have ever climbed a tree? All the little boys are like, yeah. Matter of fact, when we leave here, Pastor, I'm going to climb a tree. Find you a good sycamore tree and climb it, all right? No, don't do that. Now, again, Jesus saw him. And guys, here's the reality, and please get this. 
Jesus sees us. He sees what we do. He sees where we go. He, so with that being said, guys, again, you need to acknowledge the fact that, you know what, my God loves me so much that he sees me. And by the way, he wants to see me. How many of y'all have friends that, well, let me just ask this. Don't raise your hand because, again, I don't want people on Facebook saying, hey, that's my family member, and they raise their hand when, I, when the pastor asks them that. You, you have those family members that you don't like to see. Right? Yeah. Some of you are like, yeah. But aren't you glad this morning that God wants to see us? He wanted to see Zacchaeus. Now, again, when you think about Zacchaeus, his name means righteous one, but again, he was a tax collector. By the way, the Bible says not just a tax collector, he was chief publican. He wasn't just your normal one, guys. He was one of the leaders, one of the heads. I mean, he was a great thief, a great crook. But I'm thankful this morning that, guys, in spite of our sinful ways, in spite of our, our wickedness and ungodliness, that God sees us. And then the second thing I want you to see is God knows you. God knows us. Now, again, some of, it, some of us get freaked out by that. Man, I don't want him to know my inner thoughts, and I don't want him to know, you know, what I do and this, that, and the other. Guys, here's the thing, guys. That should cause us to desire to live more like Jesus. And again, verse number five. Not only did he see him, but look, he calls him by his name. He, when Jesus came to, to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus. Now, how did Jesus know his name? Had Jesus had ever met Zacchaeus? Guys, he's all knowing. Even when he was in the flesh, even when he became a man, guys, he was still 100% God, and he was still all knowing. And again, time after time after time, guys, we see the fact that, again, that Jesus Christ is all knowing. Again, Luke chapter number 6, verse 8, he knew the thoughts of the crowd. Acts 1.24, he knew the hearts of all. As Acts says. Matthew 10, 10 30, he knows the number of hairs on our head. Isn't that good? He knows it. John chapter 4, remember the woman at the well? Remember how astonished she was when he told her how many husbands she had? And then she said, The one that you're with now, you're not married to. And then she runs off and says, hey, come meet a man that, that knows all things. Now again, guys, that's, that, don't let that freak you out. Let that encourage you today that he knows everything about us. Let me ask you this. How many of you forget people's names? Man, that was more people than I thought. <laughs> I didn't think that many people... Now, how many of you are glad today that God knows your name? That Listen, hey, remember John chapter number 11 when, when, when Jesus told the disciples that their friend Lazarus was dead? Guys, do you understand, again, that the greatness of that story and the greatness of that, that thought? He said, listen, your, your friend Lazarus is dead. Jesus was still 25 miles away from Lazarus. But he knew that Lazarus was dead. Guys, again, this should encourage us to know that our God knows everything. He knows every thought. He knows our heart. He knows every single thing about us, but still desires a relationship with us. He knows us. Listen, when I forget your name, just know that Jesus will never forget your name. And I know most of you by name. I'm trying to think if there's anybody here that I don't know, but there might be, and I don't even want to go there. But guys, he knows us. Psalm 139, verses 1 and 2. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. He said, you know my downsitting, you know my uprising, thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Now, I want, you to, I want you to do this. Do this for me. 
you're in the sycamore tree okay are you there is everybody up in the tree right now jesus is walking by and he calls out your name how are you going to react <laughs> my, my, my first thought was does that kid almost fall out of that tree I mean, he had never met him before, but Jesus already knew him. He saw him, he knew him, and called him by name. I'm thinking to myself, if I'm up in that tree, well, number one, I'm never going to get up there because I don't like heights. So I'm not getting, listen, I'll climb a, you know, a house plant. <laughs> but a sycamore tree, forget it. How do you think Zacchaeus felt? Do you think for a single second that Zacchaeus thought, man, this, this guy's different. There's something about him. Listen, I had heard all, I'd heard all the rumors about him, but this guy knows my name. Guys, again, I would have been like, you know what, praise God that, that, again, even though he's not met me, he doesn't know anything about me, that he thought, but he knew who I was. Now, let me ask you this, because how do you feel when somebody that maybe you, you don't know very well and well let me ask you this how do you feel when your pastor remembers your name people for whatever reason especially little kids I love going back on Wednesday nights and, and just chatting with the kids boys and girls before Bible study and, and, and I'll start talking to them about their you know who they are and naming them by name this that and the other they think it's because they, look, I'm a rock star to the kids so I'm going to spend more time with them man because they like me man you're a rock star listen pastor knows my name because there's something about, again, just, just knowing people's names that makes the person feel good that you know me. And again, I can't help to think, how did Zacchaeus feel when Jesus looked up in that tree and said, Zacchaeus? And again, Lazarus, when, when he was dead for four days and, and Jesus yells the name, Lazarus. Guys, he knows us. Which brings me to point number three, guys, which is one of my favorites. Is because, again, when you understand that he sees everything, that he sees you and, and, and sees everything that you do. And, and number two, he knows you and he knows your heart. He knows your thoughts. And by the way, 1 John 3, 20 said he knows all. He knows everything. Listen, again, he said don't take no thought of it. Again, those, the, even the birds of the air, guys, he cares about. He knows when they're going to fall. He knew the beginning from the end. He knows everything about us, but yet, number three, he still loves us. Again, guys, going back to those that you know, you, people that you know, that, that maybe there's not a hatred there, but there's a very great dislike for them. And again, you think of Zacchaeus being the chief, the, basically the chief thief, he still loved him. And guys, again, this is what encourages us that even though he sees us and he knows us, he knows everything about us, guys, he still loves us. I don't understand it. I, I, I can't comprehend it. Like, God, you know my thoughts. You know my sin. You, you know everything I've done this week. And, and, and again, you've seen it and you've, you've watched it unfold, but yet you still love me. But yet somebody says something negative to us or does something negative to us, and you know what we want to do? We want to strike, we want God to strike them dead. And then you hear songs like, like Kenneth sang, a, a little bit more grace and a little lot more like mercy. And right? A little bit more like Jesus. And a lot less like me. He loved Jesus. Zacchaeus and again he wanted to go to the house of Zacchaeus again he was showing Zacchaeus this desire to have this relationship with him and again he was willing to meet Zacchaeus on Zacchaeus's level isn't that good listen guys when God saved me guess what he did he met me where I was at and again he wants to go to the house of Zacchaeus and by the way guys in that time it was customary for the person who owned the house to invite the guests but what was jesus doing he invited himself isn't that good he invited himself into our lives 
Why? Because he desires a relationship with you and I. Guys, again, this is another thing that separates Christianity from all other world religions. Amen. See? He desired this relationship. Again, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But God commands His love for, toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. And then I love what Titus chapter number 3, verses 3 and 4 says. Paul says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another, but oh boy, oh boy, but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. You know what that tells me? Listen, even though you were once like that, guess what? I still loved you. And I still wanted a relationship with you. And again, when Jesus decided he wanted to go to the house, how did the rest of the crowd respond? I cannot believe this man is getting ready to go to a sinner's house. I can't believe that wicked, ungodly sinner got saved. Anybody with me this morning? And then you start thinking to yourself, I was that wicked, ungodly sinner. And I got saved. And again, I love four chapters later, the thief on the cross. The Bible calls him a malefactor. He was a thief. And what did Jesus tell that man? Today. Oh boy, isn't that good? Yeah, you're wicked. You're ungodly. Listen, you basically don't deserve grace and mercy and love. But guess what? I'm the epitome of all those things. Jesus told that man, today you will be with me in paradise. Not because you're good, not because you're hanging on this cross, because you've put your faith and trust in me. He loves us. D.L. Moody, some of y'all know who D.L. Moody is. I love this story. Henry Morehouse was a young evangelist, and D.L. Moody had never met him. So Henry Morehouse shows up at D.L. Moody's church and, and basically tells Moody that, you know, he needs to preach at his church. <laughs> Could you imagine some young, you know, whippersnapper just coming to D.L. Moody? Saying, hey, you know, by the way, I'm, I'm, I need to preach at your church. D.L. Moody was getting ready to go out of town, so he's like, okay, whatever. He had heard a little bit about Henry Morehouse, but had never met him. So <laughs> before D.L. Moody leaves town, he has a meeting with his deacons and, and, and leaders in his church. He says, hey, just... Just watch the guy because I don't know what's, what's going to come out of his mouth or what have you. So D.L. Moody leaves, and, and Henry Morehouse preaches the first night, and he, his text was John 3.16. And so he's preaching on, on the love of God, and, and again, he continues to preach and preach. And, and so again, as, as Moody comes back into town, guess what? He was still preaching. Not the same service. <laughs> Just a different night. He had preached an entire week of messages at Moody's church from John 3.16. Seven different messages from one passage. Every one of them on the love of God. So D.L. Moody goes to his wife and listen to this. And, and again, he, he would preach from the same text for a whole week as the crowds got bigger and bigger, by the way. They loved his preaching. They loved it as he opened the Bible and he preached the love of God from cover to cover. And the week changed the life of D.L. Moody and his preaching the rest of his life. He was greatly impressed by the number of people who were saved that came to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. He had preached two sermons from John 3, 16. And, and again, Moody's wife said to him, because Moody said, hey, what do you think of him? <laughs> I would never say that to Veronica. Because I don't want her to be honest. <laughs> and listen to what Moody's wife said. She said, I think you will like him, although he preached a little different from what you do. How is that, he said. Now listen to this, guys. Here was her response to her husband, to D.L. Moody, the great D.L. Moody. She said, well, he tells sinners that God loves them. 
D.L. Moody said from that point forward, his preaching was never the same. And listen to what D.L. Moody, his response was. Morehouse, during his time, he actually challenged Moody. He said, you are sailing on the wrong track. If you will change your course and learn to preach God's word instead of your own, he will make you a great power. How did Moody react to Henry's messages? Moody explained it to himself. He said, I, knew, I never knew up to that time that God loved us so much. So did the crowded congregation. I tell you, there is one thing that draws about everything else in this world, and that is love. Now, can I just add this about Henry Morehouse? You know what Henry Morehouse was doing before he gave his life to Christ? He was a gang leader. He was a gambler, and he was a thief. And we look at that and say, that person doesn't deserve to be saved. That person doesn't deserve the love of God, right? But aren't you thankful that we don't look at people the way God does? God looks at them and says, you know what, you're a sinner, but guess what, I can change your life. Can I tell you all this morning what the specialty of our God is? His specialty is transforming sinners into saints. That's his specialty, guys. And by the way, he has been doing it for 6,000 plus years, changing people's lives one person at a time. If this same God that changed Henry Morehouse, he can change you today. The same God that changed the life of Zacchaeus can change your life today. Listen, if you're empty and your life is full of void today, I want you to know today, again, by the authority of God's word, he can and will fill the emptiness and void in your life. Because he loves you. Which brings me to point number four. He wants to save you. Again, guys, when we think of Zacchaeus, this, this filthy, rotten sinner, the people were criticizing, can't believe Jesus is going to this man's house. And by the way, they did the same thing with Matthew, did they not? They did the same thing multiple times in the New Testament. This man eats with publicans and sinners. <laughs> Aren't you thankful he's still eating with publicans and sinners? Aren't you thankful you were one of those publicans and sinners that he ate with? But again, he wants us. He invited Zacchaeus down. And again, Zacchaeus did exactly what he had told him. He made haste and he came down. And again, the word received in, in, chapter, in verse number five means to receive as a guest or to take in. So again, the idea here is that Zacchaeus received Christ as, as his guest, but at the same time, he was receiving Jesus as his Savior. Now, remember your day of salvation? Now again, I'm not asking you to pinpoint an exact date, time, place, whatever, but do you remember the day you got saved? When you received Christ? Here's the thing, guys. Zacchaeus had a choice to make, did he or did he not? Jesus said to make, make haste and come down. Zacchaeus had one of two choices. Stay up in a tree, right? Or come down. Again, what a great reminder that mankind only has two choices. You either receive the free gift of salvation that he wants to give to you, or you reject it. You can stay up in the sycamore tree, or you can make haste. And you know what I love about this, guys? is again, when you, when you see this, in verse number 9, it says, And Jesus said unto him, This day is what? Salvation come not just to Zacchaeus, but to what? His entire house. Guys, he doesn't just want to transform you. He wants to transform your entire family. He doesn't just want to save you, but he wants to save your entire family. He doesn't want to just save you, but he wants to save your spouse and your children and your grandchildren. That's who our God is. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. God doesn't want anybody to perish for eternity in a place called hell. He wants every single human being alive today to know Christ as their Savior and to have an eternal home in a place called heaven. Because he loves us. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. He saw him. He knew him. He loved him. And he saved him. 
And you want to know how I know Zacchaeus was saved? Look at verse number 8. Guys, you see genuine repentance in Zacchaeus' life. Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to who? The very same people that he had been ripping off was now the very same people he was going to give half his goods to. You want to know how I know he was saved? There was genuine repentance in Zacchaeus' life. There was genuine transformation in Zacchaeus' life. He was never the same. You know what salvation does for a person? You're never the same. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Behold, any man who is in Christ is a new creature. Behold, old things are passed away. And behold, all things become new. <laughs> Will you all be honest with me today? Can you all do that? We're in church, so I need you to be honest. Aren't you glad you're not like you used to be? Aren't you glad that old man is dead? Aren't you glad that as Romans 6 tells us, guys, that again, we've been raised to newness of life? Aren't you glad this morning that we've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the marvelous light? Guys, we've gone from being a child of Satan, of our father the devil, to a child of Almighty God has nothing to do with us but all to do with Jesus and all we have to do is believe it guys I know what my life was like and boy I'm glad I don't live there anymore I'm glad my address changed I went from the highway to hell and I don't want to use those those are not good songs to I don't want to say stairway to heaven either, but you know what I'm saying. Zacchaeus' life was never the same. And guys, again, let me just share this as well. Because again, when you, th when you talk about the crowd, they murmured that he was going to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And guys, again, I love Jesus' response in verse number 10. He said, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. He was reminding the crowd that what I just did for Zacchaeus, I can do for you. He was reminding the crowd, this is my mission. This is my purpose. This is why I'm here. I'm here to save you. Matthew 9, 12, But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Guys, he's not talking about a physical sickness. He's talking about a spiritual sickness. You see, sin has caused a spiritual, spiritual sickness. Luke 2, 17, When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, I love how Mark adds to what Matthew said. They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. And then Jesus adds this, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Aren't you glad today that Jesus is still saving sinners? Aren't you glad today that he is still calling sinners to repentance? And aren't you glad today that you don't have to climb a tree to meet him? All you have to do today is respond to his call. You see, the Spirit of God may be drawing you today. Maybe you're here today, and again, you feel there's this emptiness. There's something missing in my life. There's something that I, I can't pinpoint it. I, I can't put my finger on it, but there's something missing. That may be the Holy Spirit reminding you today that, number one, Jesus sees you that he knows you, that he loves you, and he wants to save you. So the question you need to ask yourself today is this, are you saved? Are you saved today? 
maybe again you've, you've you've heard all the rumors about jesus as zacchaeus did and maybe you've heard the great stories about jesus and all the miracles he did and 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 all the stuff that he did while he was here but there's still something missing and you know what's missing in your life you've never been transformed by the power of god you're still struggling because again like zacchaeus you've got a pretty good life maybe going well for you but until you get to a point of desperation like zacchaeus did and you figured out okay there's something missing i need to go searching for it you see zacchaeus ran and climbed out of desperation but i'm thankful that out of his desperation jesus saw his desperation met him where he was and changed his life forever ain't god good you know no matter what goes on he's still good he wants to save you today he wants to change your life but the question again you need to ask yourself are you going to stay in the tree or are you going to come down let's bow our heads for prayer We ask the praise team to make their way up. You and God right now. See, again, God, Jesus knows everything about you. He knows your thoughts. He knows your inner being. He knows everything going on in your life. I do not. I don't know where you are spiritually. I don't know where you are as far as eternal life. I don't know where you are as far as your relationship with Christ. But as Jesus gave that invitation to Zacchaeus to come down, you know what Jesus is telling you today? Come. Come. You see, Jesus met Zacchaeus where he was, and he wants to meet you where you are today. He saved Zacchaeus. He changed his life forever, and he wants to do the same in your life today. But you may have to get to a point of absolute desperation in your life, like Zacchaeus did. You have to acknowledge that there's something missing, that there's a void in your life. And the way to fill that emptiness and to fill that void is through a relationship with Jesus. And so with your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning, you have to be honest. You have to be honest with God, honest with yourself. You have to come to a point in your life to where you acknowledge and realize, I'm not saved. Something is missing. And so if you're here this morning, heads bowed, eyes closed, you would just say right now, Pastor Tim, I am not saved. Would you please pray for me right now? Would you just slip up your hand right now? Nobody's looking. I want to pray for you. Pastor Tim, would you pray for me? I am not saved. Anybody? Thank you. I see that hand. Anybody else today? Anybody, anyone else? And then, child of God, how about you? Maybe you are saved. But again, maybe you don't feel like you're as close to God as you used to be. Maybe again, again, that relationship has been hindered, whether by sin, whether by disobedience, whether by just complacency. Listen, these altars are open this morning. Maybe you have gotten to a point of, of complacency. And again, because I know, I know COVID has, has had such an impact. But you know what? The world no longer needs complacent Christianity. The world needs the church to be what God has intended the church to be. We need to go out and tell the world that no matter where you are as a sinner, God still loves you. He died for you. He was buried and he rose again three days later. And he wants to save you today. 
And listen, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning, here's what I would like for you to do right now. A couple things. Number one, I want you to pray for that person that lifted their hand for their need for salvation. That they would talk to somebody today about what it means to be saved. That even through this invitation time, that they would just get out of their seat and come talk to me or somebody else about salvation. And then number two, and again, it's Psalm 139, again, one, verses 1 and 2. What a great prayer. God, you, you search me, and you, and you know me, and you know everything about me. Is there something in your life today that's, that's hindering that relationship with Christ? Whether it be sin, whether it be something else. That, but again, there's a hindrance in your life right now. Maybe it's unconfessed sin. Maybe it's, it's, it's bitterness against somebody else. It's unforgiveness. But listen, these altars are open during this invitation time. Heavenly Father, we come to you. Father, what a great reminder today. Father, I'm so thankful that you, that you see everything about us. You know our hearts. You know our thoughts. In spite of all that, God, you still love us and you still desire to save us. And Father, my prayer right now is for that one that lifted their hand to be saved, that, that said they made that first step, acknowledging the fact that they're not saved. Father, I want to pray right now the Holy Spirit of God would just move in that person's life. Father, through this invitation time, they wouldn't put it off, but they would get it settled today. And Father, for the child of God that may be struggling, Father, I pray they are reminded that they are still loved by you. That you know them, that you see them, you know them by name. And that you still love them. So, Father, I pray that your perfect will be done during this invitation time. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this time together today. In Jesus' name.